everybody. Um, this is our second live with the Sleep Divas and I'm really excited to um, be talking about sleep supplements this morning and we're going to be looking at some surprising truths. So I'm Amanda Slinger from Perth in Western Australia and I'm a sleep coach. Hi, I'm Smita Patel from Chicago and I am an integrative sleep neurologist. Hi, I'm Nishi. I am a integrative psychiatrist and a sleep doctor, and I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm really excited to welcome everyone today because we are going to be talking about sleep supplements and what they are, how they work, how you're supposed to use them, if you should be using them, if, if you shouldn't be. So we're going to be discussing all of that today. And so if you're watching live, you can go ahead and drop your comments and questions in the Facebook chat. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so I'll, I'll do a little introduction to sleep supplements and then we can have a little uh, conversation about it. So when I say supplements, I'm talking about dietary supplements that you get over the counter at the drugstore or at the grocery store. So you want to keep in mind that supplements are what the name says. They are a supplement to a healthy diet and lifestyle. They're not a replacement for a healthy diet and lifestyle and good sleep habits. So when it comes to sleep, that's how you want to think about them. They're not something that you should be relying on to sleep, but that they are a supplement to um, good sleep hygiene and other sleep habits that we can talk about as well today. So also keep in mind that just because something is over the counter or natural, it doesn't mean that it's safe. So examples of supplements include things like vitamins. So vitamin D, vitamin B12, they include minerals. So those would be things like iron or magnesium. It also includes herbs and botanicals. So things like echinacea or ashwagandha, and then other products um, like probiotics and fish oil, all of these are considered supplements. So you can see that supplements are kind of a big umbrella there's lots of different subtypes and they also come in different forms. So they're not just capsules. They can come in capsule form. They can be tablets. They can be tinctures. They can come in gummies, powders, um, drinks, energy bars, all kinds of different forms. And when it comes to sleep, there are tons of sleep supplements out there. And when you go to the grocery store, it can be pretty overwhelming when you see rows and rows and bo bottles on the shelves. And even for me as a physician, it can make me a little bit cross-eyed um, looking at all the different labels and sorting through all the different options. So today, what we want to do is take the guesswork out of sleep supplements so people can make an informed decision and know what kinds of things to look out for. And the thing with sleep supplements and supplements in general is that the research is limited because these studies aren't funded by drug companies. So there's a lot of information we just don't know about these compounds. And also keep in mind that supplements are not regulated by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States. So they're not necessarily vetted to know if they're safe or even if they're effective. So some of the common supplements for sleep include things like magnesium, valerian, passionflower, melatonin, um, GABA, chamomile, glycine, tryptophan, L-theanine, ashwagandha. There's so many different ones. So that's not an exhaustive list by any means, but we can kind of use that as a jumping off point to discuss the different kinds of sleep supplements and whether or not they actually work and what you guys uh, prefer or recommend for yourselves or for your clients. So what do you ladies think? What's, what's your experience with sleep supplements? I agree. I think, you know, we need to add on um, to some people who may be deficient in some things like the minerals. Um, so, so kind of like the way I like to think of it is either you're deficient in something and we need to replace it. And the best way to do that sometimes is with supplements. Um, uh, so if you're like vitamin D deficient, example, for example, you know, you take a vitamin D, um, if you're magnesium deficient, you'll take some extra magnesium. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways that I like to view it, uh, in terms of supplements as well. Um, I also think that if you have too much of something, you know, then you might need to kind of get rid of it. Right. So, um, so when we talk about sleep, if we have too much stress, we kind of have to try to figure out how to get rid of it, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, to try to help with the balancing so that when you do take a supplement, it has a better chance of working. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think, um, you know, we can kind of explore here together as to how our strategies could be um, kind of combined that way. Oh, you're muted, Amanda. 
my apologies. It's a really good point. And I think it's that balance. You know, if you're just looking for a tablet to take as a supplement, it might be natural over the counter in terms of non-medicated. But <clears throat> yeah, there are other things that we can do. In, do. So if we are overstressed and we're having those um, overactive um, thoughts during the nighttime and that's keeping us from falling back to sleep, we really need to work on a number of fronts there. It's not just what supplement can I take to help me go back to sleep or stay asleep during the night. So I think it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and, yeah, definitely it's not just a one-stop shop with let me go to the pharmacy um, and go and get all the drugstore, as you guys call it, and get a, um, a supplement. We need to balance it very well. I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about some of these sleep supplements because there's so many out there. And I think when I talk to people about supplements, um, you know, some people have some reactions to them. So it's really important to understand that to go with a low dose and slowly increase it. And so the way that we take our supplements is also really important. And to um, to make sure that we, we take a supplement and see how that goes over a period of time. And I'd be interested to see what you ladies talk to your, um, your women about. I usually say two to three weeks before you really get some sort of noticeable effect, before you try adding something else to that supplement routine. I know some people take more than one type of supplement. Um, yeah, so, yeah, what, what do you recommend in terms of the, the, um, the dosing and how we go about taking the supplement? Yeah, my philosophy is kind of along those lines, which is to start low and go slow. Um, there's no rush, right? Like we're not trying to knock ourselves out. Maybe some people are, but you know, that, that's yeah. not a good way to approach using a sleep supplement because it is an adjunct, as we were saying before, to um, other lifestyle and behavioral modifications. But it also depends on the type of supplement that you're using. So for example, if you're using something like an adaptogen, which would be like ashwagandha, which is one of the ones I mentioned, that's an Ayurvedic herb that can take up to eight weeks before it really starts to work. Um, so you need to be patient and, and give it time. So it's not something you might notice straight away. Whereas if you're using something like melatonin to shift your body clock, that might work pretty quickly. You might notice changes in your body clock within a few days or within a week or so. So it really depends on what you're using. And then Smitha also mentioned kind of taking a personalized approach. And um, I do that with my patients and clients as well to see what a person's specific needs are. So if they're deficient in something like vitamin D, for example, which has a significant impact on sleep quality, um, we might want to give that three months before we, you know, recheck a level. And it's not something that a person may notice straight away. Um, it can be a very subtle effect. So it really depends on what type of supplement we're using and what we're using it for. Correct. I do all of those things. And I, <laughs> I the same too, for like some of the herbs, you know, I, I, I don't change it so quickly. I mean, it, you have to kind of go in there saying it's going to be just a very slow process and see what happens. So six to eight weeks, you know, something maybe even longer, maybe three, maybe at six to eight weeks is actually too short, right? But but where where we need to kind of wait and see what happens, along with just kind of again supporting um, the sleep hygiene aspect of it, making sure they go to bed on time and waking up and and kind of using all those um, wonderful principles. Um, so that they can continue to get good sleep. Um, in terms of supplements, you know, um, I guess if we're just going to, I'm going to just name one of my favorites. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, magnesium is probably one of my, one of my more favorite ones. Again, it might not work for you because it's not personalized for you, but, but in terms of like, um, blindly going at it, um, I find that that really does kind of help the relax the nervous system and, and, and kind of puts you more at, in time for um, getting ready for bed and, and kind of relaxing you. What do you guys think about magnesium? Yeah. yeah, I think there's so many different magnesiums that it's important that we know which one to take. And I think this is one of the, you know, the um, surprising truths. I think one of them we've just mentioned, which is so many people want a quick fix with sleep. Um, because not everyone has insomnia, right? It's sometimes it's, um, for me, I have an occasional night or two um, or a run of um, poor sleep, but then I'll get back into a good routine. So we often lean on this quick fix idea. So I think the surprising truth, number one, that we've revealed today is that it can take a significant time for some of these supplements to work. Um, 
And one of the other ones is magnesium. It's not just any magnesium that <clears throat> will help our sleep. And I think, you know, the magnesium threonate is the one that I really lean on. And again, it's one that's not going to upset. And I've got a very sensitive stomach. So I'm really mindful of um, looking at things low dose, as Nishi said, um, low and slow. I love that that uh, that saying. Um, but it's magnesium threonate, which I think has the biggest effect for me um, and the, the people that I speak to. No, I like that one because it crosses the blood brain barrier and, and yes. uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the three and eight component in magnesium three and eight also helps support, supports the production of glycine, which is also a neurotransmitter that's helpful for sleep. And what's so interesting about magnesium is that at least in the U S the studies show that about 70% of adults are deficient in magnesium. We're just not getting enough of it from our diet. And, you know, there's also micronutrient depletion in the soil. So there's lots of reasons we might not be getting enough of, of minerals like magnesium. And, you know, a couple of fun facts about magnesium. It also helps to support the production of GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter also involved in sleep and relaxation and the parasympathetic nervous system. And it's also thought to maybe help the production of melatonin, which is a sleep wake cycle regulator. So there's lots of functions that magnesium has for sleep. And it's a pretty safe supplement for most people to take unless, you know, the caveat there is for people who have kidney disease, then you want to um, use it with caution. But for the majority of people, magnesium three and eight is pretty safe to take. It's, it's backed by research. It's actually shown to help improve sleep quality, helps reduce the time it takes to fall asleep, can help with muscle cramps and things like that, that could also interfere with sleep. Um, magnesium citrate is good for people who have constipation. I see a lot of patients who are backed up in my practice and gut health is really important. <laughs> for sleep. And then magnesium glycinate is another form that people might find and it's less irritating to the GI tract. So again, this is why it's so important to have a personalized approach and see what your individual needs might be. And, and sorry, Nishi, was that magnesium glycinate or magnesium biglycinate? You can use magne- either one. Yeah. yeah. Either one okay. of those is, is yeah. less irritating. Yeah. For the yeah. GI. Yeah. Yeah, I usually go by glycinate. And in terms of dosing for magnesium, while we're talking about magnesium, um, what what sort of, I'm looking at 145 to 200 milligrams. What type of dosing are you looking at? I I can even go higher sometimes for some of my patients, but but that's a good starting point. Like 150 milligrams to 300 milligrams is kind of what I usually start with. But but I have had some patients go a little higher. Um, Just again, a a more personalized approach, right? Just because that's what they can handle. The biggest side effect with with magnesium, although glycinate is the one that's more bowel neutral, um, can be diarrhea. But sometimes, like like Nishi said, some patients are constipated, and so getting the magnesium citrate to kind of help with facilitate that, give them gives them the push they need um, to kind of continue to have bowel movements regularly is also very important. You know, it's something that we probably under talk about <laughs> just because it's bowel movement. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And just with um, a, a question I've got generally around um, supplements like magnesium, you know, we talk about vitamins, we take vitamins and, um, and I guess minerals. And, you know, I've always thought that whatever we don't need or our body doesn't need, it will just excrete. So is there um, some benefit to going to getting your magnesium levels done by a GP or is it okay just to jump in and try the magnesium? And if you're taking too much, um, you know, if you're taking too little, then you just up it. But if you're taking too much, it'll just be excreted quite safely, is my understanding. Yeah, you, you don't necessarily need to be checking magnesium levels. And in fact, magnesium blood levels are not that accurate. Um, they're not that helpful. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's a specific type of magnesium blood test, which is called RBC magnesium or red blood cell magnesium that, but it's, it can be kind of expensive um, to get that test done. So I don't routinely actually do that with, with my patients. And so, as you were saying, you know, for most people, it's, it's safe to kind of just try it out again, you know, start low, go slow. If you have GI issues, you can back off or try a different formulation. But I always do recommend talking to your healthcare practitioner or your physician, just to make sure, just to make sure there's not some other medical issue that you should be aware of, or if there's other um, medications or other supplements that it could interact with. So it's a good idea just to have that conversation, um, just so you can be you know, confident in, in what you're taking. 
True. Very important point. I mean, it's not like just because it's over the counter doesn't mean it's safe for you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so, uh, so you do have to be careful and you do want to talk to your doctor about it. Definitely. Hi, Fee. Um, just wondering if you've got any questions. Yeah, if you, you, you're happy just to sit, listen or if you've got any specific questions about sleep supplements. Not, not a, oh, well, just a comment more than anything. Um, I mean, I, I have Crohn's disease, so I take supplements and all sorts of other bits and pieces, which are good and bad for my body, but I have to have. Um, but I think my experience is that I find that magnesium doesn't necessarily send me off to sleep, but it keeps me asleep. And it, it's just a nice, kind of, I find I'm more, I'm just more relaxed with the magnesium. The thing that, interestingly, because lots of people swear by the melatonin, I actually, um, I had PTSD and um, I was trying antidepressants and there was a new one that came on the market. It was probably about 10 years ago now, actually, um, but it was a melatonin one. And I thought, great, you know, this is a much more natural kind of supplement I you know drug to try I thought yep I'm really all for it I tried it and it it removed all the side effects that I hated about the others but the interesting thing for me and I must just be a weirdo but I actually had never experienced the rage that I felt with melatonin it was crazy and I, I couldn't reconcile it, so I just had to stop taking it, even though the other parts were really good. <laughs> and I like that. I just I just never been so angry in my life. It was just weird. <clears throat> and I think, like you said, Amanda, it's it's I think for me the biggest thing is sleep hygiene. Just, you know, doing all the things that I know work. And it does, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so, yeah, that's my two cents worth. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, and, again, it's such a personal experience, as, um, as the others have talked about. Nishi, um, that anger, that rage that um, that you've talked about, did you want to um, talk to that point? Yeah, that's, that's so interesting for you that you, that you experienced that. And, and, you know, like I see so many strange reactions to melatonin with patients in my practice and uh, people don't even realize, sometimes they don't even make the connection that their depression or their irritability or anxiety is from the melatonin supplements that they've been taking. It also can cause vivid dreams and nightmares and just kind of strange experiences like that. So I've seen all kinds of idiosyncratic effects. And so that's a really important point, right? That people need to be aware that these supplements, while they can be really helpful, they can also cause weird effects that you might not even, you know, associate with the supplement. Um, I think we're going to do another talk on melatonin, so I won't go into too much detail about, about that today, but yeah, I, thanks for bringing that up. I, that's really important. And, you know, and I'll also mention just, um, kind of along the lines of what you were just saying about the magnesium helping you with relaxation across the night. What a lot of these sleep supplements do is they help to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, they help with that relaxation response. So that's kind of the bottom line. And so one thing might work for one person and something else might work for somebody else. And so, but, but the, you know, the idea is that we're really trying to induce that relaxation response. And so doing that in conjunction with behavioral strategies is even more effective. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. And that's why I think ashwagandha is another great herb to try to help with that relaxation response um, when we're going to sleep. So again, if I'm just going to pick some favorites, right? Like I think ashwagandha kind of comes to mind when we're talking about that. It's kind of, as you said, it's an adaptogen. And so, um, so it kind of levels you out. If you're too hot, it'll kind of, you know, cool you down. If you're too cold, it'll kind of warm you up. And that's one of the things about, that's the properties about ashwagandha that makes it so, uh, beneficial in that regard. It also uh, does some good on the cortisol too. So again, if you're um, kind of running around and kind of stressed out, uh, it will help with that process of it too. I need more of that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and 
um, what about um, apigenin? <coughs> Excuse me. Is this something that, um, yeah, that you, you recommend? Because that's something which is on top of my list along with the magnesium. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you, what you said, Amanda. Ap apigenin. Apigenin, okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. Is that I how you, you, you pronounce it, apigenin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I don't specifically recommend apigenin as, as a um, compound to take on its own, but so apigenin is a component of chamomile and um, you know, it's, it's a flavone that's found naturally in the chamomile plant. And so chamomile is, is very effective for, for sleep. It's been used for centuries um, or even millennia, I think since ancient Egypt or something, you know, it's been used for, for sleep problems. Um, interestingly though, chamomile is not necessarily shown to help with insomnia. It's mm -hmm. shown to help with sleep quality, but not necessarily um, a person's ability to fall asleep. So again, you know, this is why it's important to understand how these different plants work and how these uh, supplements work and, and figure out what your needs are. If you have trouble falling asleep, then chamomile might not be the best option for you. Um, but I wanted to, to get back to a question to Amanda that you, you brought up at the beginning of this talk, which is, you know, do we just try one thing at a time or, you know, should you kind of mix and match? And mm -hmm. so when I was preparing for this discussion, I, I found this really interesting study from last year, it's um, from 2021, and it was a review on medicinal plants for insomnia. And it was specifically for insomnia related to anxiety. And the conclusion was that there are three plants that have the most potential for sleep. And these were valerian, passion flower, and ashwagandha, as we've been talking Ooh. about. And even more, they found that the combination, the best combination was valerian with hops and passion flower. The combination of those three had the best results in their clinical trials. And what's interesting about this is that that is how plants have been used. So if we're talking about herbs and botanicals specifically, that's how plants have been used for centuries, traditionally. Usually like in Western medicine, we take a very reductionist approach saying like, oh, we should just take this one, you know, this one thing, this one component of ashwagandha works or this one component of turmeric works, but it's actually the synergistic effect of these different compounds and these different plants that, that work best. So yeah, I just thought that was a really interesting um, finding on that study. That is, that, that's really interesting. And I, <clears throat> the other one that I was looking at um, last year, I dived into some research on um, tart cherries and this is where I really came across this, this concept, which you mentioned at the start, Nishi, that there's not a lot of um, research. Um, you know, if there is any research, it's a very small study group. And so not really that robust in terms of like, yes, tart cherries work or they don't. And again, it comes back to try it. If it's not going to do you any harm, try it. And if it works. Um, yeah. So just with that study that you mentioned, Nishi, was that um, taken as a tea? Do you, did they talk about the method? Was it a, a, a tablet? Was it a tea? What was it? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I know this was a review of multiple studies, so I can go back okay. and kind of tease out what, yeah. what the different studies used. Yeah. But, you know, to your point, a lot of these things can be taken in different forms. And so again, it, it depends on the individual. Like for me, if I drink a tea before I go to sleep, I'm going to have to get up and use the bathroom and that's going <laughs> to cause more to sleep, sleep disruption. So I'm not going to take a tea, but that might work for some people. So, you know, you have to kind of take your individual system into account. Uh, when I tell my yeah. patients, they do drink the tea, like they got to drink it two hours before at bedtime, just mm -hmm. so that they have time to, you know, process it and, um, and hopefully can go to sleep and stay asleep. Yeah. And of course, half lives um, of these, you know, supplements is something also important timing of taking them. So whether it's um, a tea, obviously, you don't want to be getting up to to have a bathroom break. But if it's a supplement with a short half life, you need to be taking it quite close to bedtime. So um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's quite a bit to understand around sleep supplements. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead, Fee. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just curious about CBD oil. I've heard so many positive stories about CBD oil. I'm curious about your thoughts. So I do think, um, you know, CBD helps sleep and there's like different CBDs like CBN, there's different components of, of these cannabinoids, um, which 
you know, uh, CBN might be more beneficial for sleep. But my overall take on that is that I think it works, you know, acutely, but I don't think I want someone on it for the long term based on what research I have right now, right? So I'm trying to be more evidence-based about this. And we want to make sure that if we're going to recommend something that we want it to be safe and long-term, no other issues, no develop of tolerance and um, not addiction so much, but just needing higher and more, uh, more of it to kind of do the job. Um, and so, so that's based on that for information that I have right now, um, I, I would only kind of use CBD oils or CBNs, you know, just kind of uh, short term. Mm. Yeah, I did um, a little bit of um, personal research on this over the summer break, and I chose a, a point in time where um, where I, I wasn't so much having sleep difficulties, but I wasn't unwell. I wanted to be very neutral around it, and I didn't feel that it made any difference to my sleep. But um, I'd like to try it again when I'm perhaps having trouble falling asleep. But I know you know many people I speak to they do find benefits. With the CBD oil um, in Australia, it's not that readily available. Um, I know in the US, Nisha, you give CBD to your puppy dog. <laughs> Sleeps great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ladies, um, I bought my cat from used to to give it to the cats to to keep them chilled because I've got one. I've got two cats, and the other one. <laughs> I swear, if he were human, he would be a crackhead. He's <laughs> a stage five clinger, a bit of a neurotic cat, and he could have done. Oh, he could have done really well on that, I reckon. <laughs> Nishi, have you got much experience with CBD oil, CBD oil with um, with humans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, but it works really well for my dog. Yeah, with human. Um, yeah, so similar to Smitha, you know, um, some of my patients really do benefit from it. And especially people who struggle with racing thoughts, or people mm. who have inflammation, um, kind of generalized inflammation in the body aches and pains. Um, even headaches can be really helpful for, for that population. But as Smitha was saying, um, I recommend short-term use or intermittent use because we simply don't know. We just don't know what, what happens to people if they use this continuously for a long period of time. And, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, so I see people, people who have PTSD, anxiety, depression, that sort of stuff. And so it's going to have impacts on their mood as well. And so that, that's something that um, I take into account. But again, you know, if it, if it works, then, um, you know, try things out see how it feels, see how it affects you, but um, don't, don't rely on it. You don't want to lean on it too much because that can start to create more anxiety, right? Like if you run out, you don't have your CBD. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. So, you know, you want to do it in a measured way. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well said. So look, we're um, just about on the half hour mark um, and we run these lives for half an hour. So I'm going to start uh, wrapping up. I just had one comment to make before I do and I'll go around the room and see if anyone else has a final comment. Um, we do have uh, our next live event. I haven't got the date with me. Um, it's going to be on melatonin, as Nishi mentioned, and it's the 19th of May. So if you're interested to join us, then fee, please do. And anyone watching this uh, the replay, come and join us on the 19th of May for the, uh, the melatonin discussion. So I just wanted to talk about dosing um, very quickly and what is on a, the front label of a, um, of a supplement um, is not necessarily what is, you know, what's the ingredient. So you need to look at the back. And I think it's just really important if you're going to go down the route of whether it's magnesium or any of the ones that we've talked about, look on the back and look at the actual ingredients there and, and how much you're actually getting. So something might say a thousand milligrams of magnesium, but when you look on the back, it's not, it's a much lower dose. So um, yeah, just be mindful of that. Anyone else? Some final comments, Nishi? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just kind of piggyback on that, which is that there's great variability between what's actually um, on the label and what's actually in the supplement itself, um, because these things are not regulated. So I recommend to, to all of my patients and anyone who's listening to make sure that whatever supplements you're using are of high quality and have been tested. And how you can um, ascertain this is by looking for brands that have certain um certifications on their label. So in the US, these might be NSF International, US Pharmacopeia, 
Underwriters Laboratory or Consumer Lab, and you'll see a seal on the label. So this is what I recommend to my um, patients. I only, and personally too, I only use supplements that have been tested. Yes. And there's one more, which is the GMP, I think is another one that I also use um, as part of the list of uh, certified labels. So good manufacturing process, I think is what it stands for. Perhaps we can share that in the link to the live, that list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining and uh, please any comments, um, put them in the, the link below in the um yeah, in the, the comments. So thank you so much. That was really interesting. Again, we could have talked for hours, but I love these short 30-minute sessions. Have a lovely day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.